Good morning. It is Tuesday, May 19th. It is yet another day here in Hawaii. So glad that you could join us here for the COVID care conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative as well as Hawaii Pacific Health. Good morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji. And good morning. I'm Yenji Denise. Thank you so much for being with here with us here on Tuesday. We are so lucky to have Scott Murakami, the director of the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations, joining us. Uh, Tuesdays are always a busy day for us here on this show because so many of you have unemployment questions. We want to get to as many as possible. Um, we do go back and look at the previous week and try to boil down those questions. So please, we know that a lot of you are writing in. Keep continuing to write in your converse your your questions and please. Please know that we have gone through all the previous questions. We try to distill those for Director Murakami so that we can have a very productive conversation. That's why right. 436 comments that came in last week, Tuesday, over 700 the week before. So uh, a lot to go through, obviously. And uh, we tried our best again to sort of condense those things. Before we get to the director, good news that was announced yesterday, no new cases in Hawaii uh, with COVID-19 cases in Hawaii. So. Uh, again, a, a great sign as we hear more from the governor, he revealed that color-coded system that the state will begin implementing in the different phases of the reopening of Hawaii. So, uh, so far so good. And uh, we continue to see those numbers stay low. But right now we wanna bring in Director Scott Morcami to the conversation to talk a little bit more, of course, about the updates to the department uh, and, and all the efforts that's being made there. Good morning, uh, Scott. If you can maybe start off by sharing us an update with some of the numbers and where you guys are at right now with that backlog of claims. Sure. So um, uh, to, uh, as of uh, May 18th, we were able to process 169,874 claims. That's 71% of all of the claims that we've received. Um, of that, we paid out 126,798 claims. We have denied 43,076 claims, and we still have 68,177 claims that are in, in process that we're working on. And last time you were here, you were saying that you were getting one to 2,000 claims a day, I believe. How? What's the rate like right now? We still are receiving about that same level. Um, I think a lot of those are uh, people who are providing replicated claims, but it's about that same amount. Okay, okay. One of the and I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. One of the things that we wanna maybe do is, <clears throat> before we get into some of the new questions, is follow up on some of the questions that were asked last week. I know that you said you have to go back and get some more information. One of the questions that came in last week was regarding uh, qualifications and tax information. So um, our pool applicants asked to, they're asked to provide the 2019 tax information, but are they allowed to provide 2018 tax information instead if they have not yet already filed for 2019, being that that was extended? Unfortunately, um, by federal, the federal requirement uh, requires us to use the uh, 2019 tax year as uh, the basis for determining someone's eligibility for the pool program, as well as the benefit calculation. So if you have not filed your 2019 taxes, you can submit other documents that establish what your net income was for 2019. Those can include on the revenue side, 1099, uh, 1099s, other types of receipts that uh, you've, you may have received or that you may have issued for payments that you uh, received, as well as the expenditures that you have. So things like paste, uh, excuse me, bank receipts, uh, billing notices, things of that nature, but anything that helps, helps us establish the 2019 net income for that individual. Um, we have a question here. Where did I? It goes. There, there's so many people writing in um, about the about backdating. Um, th that some people say that uh, I'm trying to file for backdate claim, can't get through. I've emailed multiple times. Uh, if the date is not correct, if you've been separated from your employer earlier than what the system has determined, how do you resolve that? So um, we do have a backdate email and I appreciate uh, Marshall of you that you sent your email there. I can tell you that we have the Koi office of the Koi UI office, as well as six people working in the convention center to address all of the backdate issues. So really what happened is um, I realized that the system did go down on everybody. Uh, this was back in the middle of March. And so as a result, that did create this problem where people had to file their claims later. Uh, and than the uh, separation date they had. But I can tell you that we are getting uh, through them. Uh, we will get through all of them. Uh, and I just appreciate uh, everyone's patience in that. 
So if they already did email that backdating email, just continue to wait for Great. a response from that. And we are working through it, but again, you know, we have um, we just have a lot of claims, and the six uh, sixty eight thousand are in addition to things that such as the backdating issues that we have, because uh, uh, um, some of the backdating issues people may have received payment already on some of their earlier their more recent claims, but we're trying to make them whole for the ones that they had missed earlier. Okay. How is the response time uh, going? I mean, when you know we've talked to you for many weeks now, and we've seen the progression as you stand up more volunteers. How quickly are calls being answered and emails being returned? So that still is uh, not as quickly as I'd like it. I'd, I'd like to see it. Quite frankly, I think um, you know. I think. I guess the best way to put it is what's slowing us down now is that the types of questions are much more complicated. So a lot of the uh, simpler things about certifications and whatnot, we've been able to work through. Now we're getting to much more complicated questions that people are uh, bringing up, uh, questions about you know that their separation from work, um, things of that nature that are a little more challenging for our call center people. So the, our we're taking a little more time to try to answer those questions instead of having to call them back. And that's why we're seeing some delays in it. Um, you know, I, I guess one of the things that I'm, ha I guess not to say happy about, but one of the signs of progress is that the questions are becoming much more difficult. They're not the rudimentary types of things that we saw in the past. So it's, we do see part of the problem is being that the response for each individual claim takes a little bit longer now. I want to go back to that certification question that you kind of brought up because there was a question that was asked last week and we needed to get some clarification on uh, some people saying that if they had issues with, you know, we know that there was like a three week timetable, but they were unable to file and provide the qualification materials needed. Would that necessarily make them disqualified if they fell out of that three week window? So what, what happened was um, we actually removed the inactivation for, uh, the three week window for certifications. Cause you're right. If a claimant doesn't follow certification for three weeks, unfortunately what happens is their account becomes inactivated under normal circumstances. But on um, April 25th, what we did was we uh, implemented a, a solution within, the, uh, within our application that removed the inactivation code. So the claim stayed active irregardless of whether or not somebody followed the three, was able to get in within that three week period. Um, unfortunately, if you were affected before 425, those are the claims that the certifications that we've got to go back and manually uh, address. Uh, John Ark has a question. Will unemployment claimants need to post or complete resumes at some point on the Hawaii Net Hire website to continue to qualify for the benefits? I know the searching for three jobs a week um, requirement was waived, but uh, I, I'm curious about John's question. Yeah, you know, John, I think um, we, we did waive that by executive order, but I do think that there it would be beneficial for, for people to put their um, resumes up on Hiring at Hawaii because we do have people looking for jobs. One of the things that um, uh, I can share with you is that we we also, in addition, I know a lot of the conversation has been about unemployment insurance, but we also have a pro program called Brother Reducing Unemployment Disruption and Driving Economic Regeneration. And what it does is it provides a thousand dollars to businesses who are hiring people since March first. It pays five hundred dollars upon hiring, and then another five hundred um, after six months. And what the fund was meant to do was offset any kind of training costs that the company has. And a lot of those companies are still hiring. Um, my last check was we had issued about um, just under just about a hundred thousand dollars in the first six month payment portion of it. So um, the best way to get recognized by those companies is on hiring now. Now whether or not that's going to be a requirement or not, I'm, I'll look into that for you and determine whether or not uh, it will be a requirement. Um, I think ultimately we're going to have to at some point have people apply for it or get back on HireNet. I just don't know when that's going to be, John. All right. <clears throat> One of the questions that we had come in uh, that was sent to us last week we, was regarding, of course, the pool claims and the 1099 workers. Uh, now, one of the questions that came in uh, was from John, and he asked that, how do people who are 1099 workers that have multiple jobs and, and for different employers still as an independent contractor file for unemployment benefits? 
do they have to fill a different claim for each job or gig or do they combine all the sources of income together? So we know a lot of musicians maybe have multiple employers or whatever, maybe right. how do they file? So um, John, I'm going to make the assumption that all of these jobs that you have are gig jobs, that there are independent contractor, you know, bona fide independent contractor types of jobs and none of them are wages. So assuming that um, all of those claims would be compiled on all of those gigs, I guess you could call it, would be compiled, combined together and filed as one claim. Um, so uh, the best way to look at it isn't from your revenue sources. It really is based on you as an individual because the determination for uh, benefits is calculated on your individual net income. So if you have multiple sources of income coming in, it consolidates to yourself and then the expenses are run off of that. So that's the best way to look at it. Um, yeah, if you then get called back for a particular gig, let's say, uh, it really it, the real determining factor is how much you're actually earning from that gig on a weekly basis. If what you earn on that week exceeds your weekly benefit, then at that point, you would, uh, your benefit would, be, uh, would stop. Okay, got it. Um, and so if they were to, um, for those still kind of in that same line of the 1099 workers, um, what if, if they get one, so if they get one of those jobs back, uh, but still, they are still having, um, obviously, a, a lack of income because of other jobs that haven't been submitted. You're just saying that they're going to have to sort of assess and go one at a time as those jobs come back online? Right, because the the real issue is um, you can maintain your benefit as long as the weekly benefit um, exceeds the amount that you earn during that week. That's the best way to look at it. And once you've exceeded more than that, then you would, of course, uh, have to... Uh, uh, you would lose your benefits at that point. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, kind of a simple one, just asking how do people uh, file for back pay? Here we go from Lisa. How do we file for back pay? Um, I, I know that there's multiple, obviously, factors and, and obviously different ways to do that, but how, how would they, what is the best way to do that? So, Lisa, we do have a back pay website. I, sorry, I don't, my desk is absolutely messed, but we do have a back pay website, so you can just email us. And let us know. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see. It's back dlir.ui.backdate at hawaii.gov. And we do again have um, people in the convention center, six people in the convention center, as well as the staff on Kauai going through the the uh, those email addresses. Um, Tracy Adams, and excuse me if you guys have covered this. Sorry, I had some connectivity issues here for a second. She says she still hasn't been able to log into the website to certify and attempts to confirm what my login information by phone for three weeks now have been unsuccessful. How do I reach a human to get help with my login ID confirmed and certified to get paid? Gloria, uh, just above there, says, when will you fix the high volume uh, issues, the please try again issues? I, I wonder for both of these, uh, for both of these people writing in, and there are, there are many people who say that they haven't been able to connect, uh, are there any plans to actually open a physical space where someone could go down and stand in line and talk to a person? I think a lot of people would feel a lot more reassured if they weren't having to go through technology, but they could actually speak face to face. So I can tell you, um that for our systems now, uh, we are able to receive a significant amount of uh, certifications online. So for example, this past Sunday, we took in 68,000 certifications and we didn't see any system degradation. So if you do get the high volume message, uh, please don't quit on it. Um, keep clicking on it a couple of times because it may take one or two tries. You know, if you click on it once and it doesn't work, you're probably doing it during the high volume times. I can tell you if you do it later in the evenings, it seems to work. Um, the traffic is less, I can tell you. But um, but we haven't seen any real system degradation from it, but there is just a lot of traffic. So uh, if you try clicking on it a couple of times or three times, uh, most, most people by the third time have been able to get in. Um, I can tell you, uh, Tracy, you're not, alone there by our data it's suggesting that there are about nine thousand people who have actually filed claims that are clean that there's nothing wrong with them but they haven't filed a weekly certification and so um what we're doing is we have 20 people now in the convention center that are actually calling these individuals and walking them through the process of certifying so tracy if you're one of the people who's clean claim has been processed cleanly and you haven't had a chance to certify, I can assure you that we are trying to call those individuals up 
and work with them on how to actually follow the certification because it's pretty clear that um, that they uh, have done everything up to this point accurately. It's just a matter of working with them to make sure they know how uh, that they have to certify and how to actually do that. So in terms of actually being able to come in in person, do you anticipate the office opening at any point or are you just put tabling that for now? So we actually are in uh, planning some, we're going through a planning stages with all of our divisions within the department on how best to um, address this. And what I can share with uh, both of you as well as your viewers are that, you know, our first concern is clearly for public safety and the safety of our claimants. So uh, as long as we can assure the adequate social distancing, as long as we're in compliance with the necessary federal requirement, uh, state requirements, that's our first uh, concern. And uh, uh, of course, the other concern we have is for the safety and well-being of our employees. So how we do that differs from each location. So it's pretty tough to say right now how we would do it. I can tell you we are uh, cognizant of the fact that we're going to have to do that shortly. And we would like to be able to provide services to people in a variety of ways. Um, but uh, until we have a better plan of how we're going to do that and when it's going to happen, yeah, I'll just kind of let you know that we are looking at it. And again, our priority is making sure that the public and our claimants remain safe. One of the questions that we seem to get, and there's still a lot of questions around, is with Uber drivers and Lyft drivers, how should they file through this process and, and what would be the best route for them to go through? So for Uber and Lyft drivers in particular, just for these two organizations, uh, please file through our normal unemployment insurance program. And the reason is that, you know, I think they're typically considered uh, gig workers or independent contractors. But for the Department of Labor and the application of the unemployment insurance law, we actually have to apply uh, specific rules from that are in statute as to whether or not an individual is a covered employee. So about, I think it was in about 2017 maybe, yeah, 2017, the determination was made that Uber and Lyft drivers are actually supposed to be covered employees. And as a result, they do qualify for unemployment insurance benefits through the, the regular unemployment process. And this was beneficial for Uber drivers and Lyft drivers before the PUA um, program started up because they could get normal UI benefits. Um, so I would uh, let your viewers know to please apply through the normal um, unemployment insurance program, we will um, process your claim as a, a regular UI claimant. Now, one thing you should know is that uh, what happens is we have to match up your wages with that of, which is what, with what's provided from Uber and Lyft. And at times we do have some challenges getting that. But from what I understand, Uber and Lyft drivers do have access to that data on their platform. So, um, just go, go ahead and download that data for us and be ready to share that with us. And then we'll be able to do your eligibility requirements based off of that. I'm seeing a bunch of tax questions. Let's um, put this one up from Susie Shim, who says, confirm please that all benefits are taxable income, even the extra $600. Is it possible to take out, take out the withholding taxes from the weekly benefits now? So, um, I shouldn't say it's taxable, it is reportable, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I believe with the PUA program, there is, you agree to, what was it now? Shoot, I better check on that one just to make sure I get it safe, correct, because I don't want to mess it up. Um, sure. But but I will tell you that it is reportable. Okay, okay, so you potentially are on the hook to pay taxes yeah. for it. Correct. One of the questions that it, it's kind of a, a simple one, but but important is, is the unemployment office going to run out of money? Uh, the different sources of income, we know that there is, of course, the money that was collected in the fund, but also from the federal government. Uh, what is sort of the latest on how much money is maybe left? So, Connie, here's um here's what I'll share with you. I'm sorry, I'm going to just pull, pull up some numbers for you. So, from the state unemployment insurance fund, well, since the start of COVID-19, uh, which was March 1st, we paid out from the trust $284,951,469. Prior to that, we had about $594 million in the trust. So um, I will tell you that our projected, projected date for ex exhausting the fund is June 11th of 2020. Um, I had said before that it was on May 10th, but we didn't take into account that we were still receiving some tax, um, some tax revenue from 
employers. So the new date is June 11th. Uh, but we have applied for lack of a better term for a line of credit from the US Treasury. And the money comes through the US Department of Labor. Um, so we have to uh, each quarter apply for this. So we've been doing that diligently and on time so that if it were to expire, we would have a line of credit to continue benefits on. Um, I would tell you that um, uh, from what I understand, that line would be tax-free, uh, excuse me, interest-free um, until December 31st, uh, 2020. So, you know, from our perspective, we are making sure that there are funds adequately uh, backstopping our trust uh, to continue to pay benefits. Wow, it's crazy to think about exhausting those funds that's less than a month away. Right, and you know, it's, um, you know, when you add up all of the money we paid through uh, the unemployment insurance program, to date we paid just under $600 million in UI benefits. That includes the federal money as well as the state trust. Add to that another 109 million that was paid out of the PUA program. And you're talking about $709 million that we paid. I mean, it's a lot of money that's going back out. And I, I realize that I, I don't want to frustrate people who have been waiting and they're still in process. But, you know, again, those are the facts of what we're seeing now. So uh, it is a staggering amount of money that we're seeing pay out. Um, but I, again, you know, my concern really is for the people whose claims we're still processing. And, and on that, the last time you were on here, you said that you hoped that you would be basically through those or caught up, if you will, sometime toward the end of May. Does that still seem realistic given what you had said about the complexity of the claims that you're now addressing? You know, I, I think, I, I don't think so. You know, I, I think part of the challenge is going to be that we had thought that the number of people that were uh, out there that were filing CCs, the initial data that said that people had clean claims that just needed to file CCs was much higher, it was about 30,000. We found out that it's only about 9,000. So the concern that we have, and again, part of the challenge with this is, you know, the antiquated systems that we have don't provide good analytics for us. So unfortunately, we have to make decisions with the best, I mean, well, that's our job, right? We gotta make decisions on the best data that we have. Um, so. Yeah, it's really difficult to ascertain really when we'll get through these because the higher the number of cases that we have to adjudicate, clearly the longer it's going to take. And that's why what we're doing now is we're trying to get to just that some population, that one population of people that we really have to adjudicate cases on, that will then help us to determine really how long we're looking at. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you that um, unemployment is only part of the story. Right, because it's not just about pay, paying out the claims. There's a whole back end audit process that we have to make sure of. You know, we've been receiving concerns nationwide about fraud. So that's why we've been very diligent about how we've managed the trust and made sure that, you know, as much as we wanted to just pay benefits out, we had to be mindful that there were always fraud issues. And this isn't anything about people in Hawaii, but there are people from all over the world that are trying to get access to this money. So, you know, we've been very, um, diligent about that. But the other portion about unemployment, I think um, one of your um, callers or um, posts had come in about the reemployment of higher net. You know, actually the unemployment insurance program is part of what's called the Employment Securities Act. And um, what it does is it doesn't just look at unemployment, it looks at reemployment. And that's an important thing to remember that, you know, ultimately what we want to do is get people back to work. Um, so this whole process of the impact of COVID-19 on the department is going to be very, very um, far reaching and it's going to be going on for quite some time. And so I don't want to give people the illusion that, you know, come end of May, everything's going to go back to normal. That's not the case. We're still going to look at a number of people who are unemployed. We still will have the extension programs going on. We still will have, um, you know, this will still have to live with the system that we have now as much as we've been able to modernize the front end and the, the move people off the old web portal onto our new SQL environment. The reality is that we still have a, you know, a data structure and an engine that was built in the 1980s that resides on the mainframe. So all of these things are going to um, be with us for quite a while into the future. Um, I, I wanted to get, you know, to your point about the complexities and different programs that are trying to keep people employed. One of those is the PPP program. And Lisa Kavai says, if you got a PPP loan, 
are you still eligible for PUA? Um, that's an interesting question because some people who applied for PPP didn't know if it or not, so they applied for uh, benefits through the PUA system, and now they perhaps have both. So what is the eligibility there? I'm not sure about PPP. I would have to check on that. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I'm really not sure. Yeah, that's a tough question. I can look into that and try to get your response next time, if that's okay. Okay, okay we'll <clears throat> make sure that we follow up um, with that. One, you know, another question that we got in uh, from Derek was regarding sort of the, the people that are calling back. Um, and he said that he's called the hotline four times uh, and they keep, uh, the people that he's spoken to said that an examiner will contact him regarding his claim. And again, he was another one uh, in the Uber and Lyft sort of situation. Uh, what would you recommend with that? Um, he said he's been waiting eight weeks since he's had any income or has received since his initial claim. Um, what is the difference? What is the examiner compared to maybe somebody else? And, and what is that backlog or what does that look like? So the claims examiner is the third level of, or the highest level of um, uh, assessment that we do on a claim. They're the people who actually have to do fact findings. So they actually have to record, document what, the, what their um, discussion is with both the employer and the employee. Um, it's hard to say for that particular case because it could be a situation where um, the person was work make, you know, had multiple jobs or something of that nature. But um, I can tell you for Uber and Lyft, Part of the challenge is that we don't always get the data from Uber and Lyft on employment wage, uh, wage employment, uh, excuse me, the payment to um, individuals. So the best thing that they can do is share with us the information that they have. But that situation, uh, once they're at the claims examination portion, it is at the highest level of, um, of complexity that we would have in a case, uh, claim. And that's one of the people who are, um, going to have to wait through the adjudication process. And we are trying to get more people who can do that, but it is, uh, um, it's not an easy thing to do. It is both a uh, slow and arduous process, but it actually requires them to render a decision that can be appealed. And then subsequently uh, it can be challenged uh, through a private right of action by the individual, both on the employer side and the employee side. A lot of people who are, can do it. We do have quite a number of volunteers who are working on it now, um, but uh, that's the difference between a claims uh, with a claims examiner. Um, I know that you had said before that some of the people who were working in the in a volunteer capacity at the convention center were now starting to, you know, reattach to their previous employment um, some elsewhere in the state. Uh, do you anticipate losing workers? I mean, how, given the high volume of calls that you're getting and all of these people who say that they're not getting the responses they need, um, how is that going in terms of your own staffing? Sure. So um, what I can tell you is that uh, we have been in regular discussions both with the administration, the governor's office, as well as um, uh, DHERT. And the priority is to keep people staffed at the unemployment insurance office, um, you know, we do have a regular schedule of people coming in. We always can use more uh, more people helping us. So, um, you know, they are doing everything they can to send people our way. But as time proceed, pro progresses, I would imagine that people will have to go back to their desks and do, do some work. We are looking at ways in which we could do that remotely outside of the convention center. But yeah, right now, um, my big concern is the time that we have left to actually process as many claims as we can. Okay, we know that you, uh, again, are very busy. And we, again, we appreciate you just taking the time to join us. We unfortunately are, are out of time. Um, and we apologize again, so many questions coming in. We will once again, try to get some of these answered uh, and, and consolidate as much as we can next week. But uh, Director Scott Murakami, thank you so much for joining us once again. And uh, we look forward to another update next week. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, aloha. We still see a lot of questions coming in um, for things that we addressed earlier. So as soon as this uh, live stream ends, please go watch from the beginning some questions about taxable, taxability and whatnot. Just remember that anything that you do receive is reportable. So it depends on how much income you generate, but uh, that does mean that it could potentially be taxed. So keep that in mind as you start to get these benefits. We know a lot of you are frustrated. We appreciate all your questions. Please, you know, if we didn't get to something that you want covered, please write and let us know like that PPP question. We'll be asking that 
next week. I mean, the wonderful thing is that Director Murakami has made himself available and we can, can continue this conversation week to week and hopefully get as many of your questions answered as possible. That's right. And again, I, I think that there are still some questions around uh, the pool program as well. A lot of people still uh, asking about those. So we will make sure that we follow up and uh, do our best once again to consolidate all of that. Uh, in, uh, in other news, of course, we'd like to always end with some happier news and highlight some of the heroes and the people doing good things in our community. And uh, this one we're focusing today on Hawaii Island. That's right. Activate Hawaii Aid is a coordinated emergency response to the needs right here on Hawaii Island. They are doing a feed the people. Oh, we got to squeeze to this side. Um, feed the people drive. So you, uh, I've gone onto their website. It's really amazing. You go to uh, activate Hawaii Aid. Dot org and you can fill out a form if you need help if you need food they're doing these food packets um, or if you want to donate in some capacity maybe you want to help drop off there are so many um, elderly folks on this island that need that, that don't necessarily have access to transportation or because of COVID it's dangerous for them to go out so they're really trying to um, link to resources with people who can help provide them another thing that they're doing is cakey care packs uh, these include include you know, snacks and they also, non-perishable food, coloring sheets and re resources to help kids better understand the pandemic, as well as materials to support parents to help engage their kids and cope with the stress of living through this pandemic. We're seeing so many families, you know, being inside without having school to keep their children occupied. So these cakey packs um, are wonderful ways to engage kids and give parents some ideas on, on how to spend that time with kids at home. So we mahalo activate hawaiiaid.org. Uh, they've partnered with the Chef's Hui along with a number of organizations including the Hawaii Community Foundation. They're doing great work here on the Big Island. So again, check out their website, activate Hawaii Date. Oh, activate hawaiiaid.org. Uh, the other thing, Ryan, that we want to also uh, remind people about is that there's a food distribution happening tomorrow in Honolulu. That's right. We've seen the large uh, number of people that go there, the lines that have uh, been meeting those d distributors each and every week. Uh, again, that will be happening tomorrow at Aloha Stadium beginning at 10 a.m. You can get more information at the Food Bank's website that we have listed there below. And again, this is sort of something that has become a weekly routine there, Wednesday and Fridays, they seem to be doing it at Aloha Stadium. We also saw it though at a Leeward Community College. So uh, they're sort of maybe moving around, but right now, again, tomorrow's one will be at Aloha Stadium. You won't be able to get food from 10 o'clock, but we do have, have heard stories of people lining up as early as 7 a.m. So expect to sort of wait if you're gonna be in those long lines. But again, we mahalo the Hawaii Food Bank as well as their partners for doing this, uh, again, this bi-weekly food distribution. Yeah, and that food distribution, they really recommend making sure that you have a full tank of gas and that you, you know, maybe come two to three people in a car, uh, heads of households. You do have to prove that you are from different households um, and have your trunk clean and empty so they can just put the food right in there. It's 50 pounds of fruits, vegetables, eggs, milk, and meat. So a really nice size package for people, but you do have to wait in line. So Pack your patience, and we really appreciate all the volunteers who are out there helping to make this possible because we know that so many families are relying on this food aid right now. That's right. And tomorrow we will be back once again with a, our Ask the Doctor series. We're actually going to be focusing on kids and pediatric doctors and the impact that this has had on children, uh, but not only just, of course, the impact of COVID, but just overall the, the mental health of children during this time. So we'll be talking to Dr. King from Hawaii Pacific Health, who will be joining us. And then on Thursday, we'll be speaking to Dr. Sarah Park. Yeah, we really look forward to talking to both of those doctors. Uh, Dr. King is gonna help us with how to make sure that our kids are staying healthy through the pandemic. And Dr. Park will tell us how to keep our community healthy. She's of course the state epidemiologist. We're gonna be talking to her a lot about testing and contact tracing as we move into this next phase of reopening our community. How do we do that safely? And how does the state continue to make sure that we're tracking COVID in our community? Right. So again, a busy week and we appreciate everybody for tuning in. Once again, we'd like to thank our partners, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative, as well as Hawaii Pacific Health for bringing you this conversation. Again, we apologize that we didn't get to every single question. Uh, we always know that Director Marukami has a lot of questions and we try our best to cover as much ground as possible. We encourage you to go back and watch past episodes as many of the questions that were asked later in the show were actually answered in weeks prior. So we hope that 
you might find your answer there and uh, good luck. We know that it's a long wait for many people and that you continue to keep calling and emailing, but uh, hopefully you get some answers soon and we'll continue to provide you as much support as we can as well. Until tomorrow at 10.30, we'll say aloha and see you then. Aloha.